and welcome to our Witches Witch activity video. Um, we had five problems to solve where we had to decide what kind of hypothesis test or confidence interval we needed, um, and then work through every step of that hypothesis test and interval. So we're going to start with number one. Um, as I read through here, I always try to outline and underline important words that help me decide the type of test. So this is an experiment performed to see if sensory deprivation over extended period has any effect on alpha wave patterns. There were 20 inmates in a prison that were randomly split into two groups. So again, now I know right now that I had two separate groups. Members of one group were placed in solitary confinement and those in the other groups were remaining in their own cell. So again, when I look at the data, I'm going to think of this as group one, and then this is group two. After being in their cells, seven days later, alpha wave frequencies were measured in all subjects, right? So in our decision tree, the first thing we need to deal decide, are we worried about um, means or proportions? You can see that this is quantitative data, right? Numbers that measure. And so those are things that we can take a mean. So I know it's a mean. Our next defining feature is whether it's one group or two. And we said we've got two groups. As we follow our tree diagram down, our next decision is, are these independent groups or is this paired data? When we said these were two separate groups, that means this first data point in list one and the first data point in list two are not related. They are independent, different people. So we know we have independent groups. And that's how we decided that we have a two sample t-test. And as I follow down our tree, after I have the name of the test, I give a, or we have developed a sample of what these hypotheses should look like because it's about means, the population mean symbol, mu. For the first group, I'm going to use NC for non-confined. The null hypothesis is that those um, mean alpha waves would be equal to the mean for the confined group. The alternative hypothesis is that these two groups are different. I want to read back through the problem quickly to see, does it say they hypothesized it would be lower <clears throat> for one group, higher from one group, or just different, right? And the language I see in here is, does it have any effect? So it's not saying they think it's higher or lower, just does it have any effect? So I'm going to choose not equal to. All right, so I've got my hypotheses. I've got the name of the test. Once I have this name of the test, then I can um, look at my list of assumptions for any mean test. I only have two assumptions to check. Do I have a random sample? And I do, that was stated in the problem. Second, I need to either have my sample size greater than or equal to 30, or I need to have near normal population. Well, we only have 10 people in each of these samples. So this one's not met. So I'm going to actually have to look at the histogram for each data set and decide if it's near normal. So remember to do that. You're going to enter your data in list one and list two. You'll go to second step plot. Choose your histogram tool. Do first list one. It will have a frequency of one. And then just use your zoom nine to get your graph. When you do that, you're going to see something that has no outliers and no large tails or long tails. I'm going to repeat with list two. And you're going to see the same thing. So we are going to have our conditions met so we can go forward with this hypothesis test. 
we want to uh, perform this test at a 0.01 significance level. We're going to indicate our calculator steps, the test statistics, and p-value. So we know it's going to be a two-stamp t-test. First thing it's going to ask me is, are we using data or statistics? We actually have data. My calculator needs to know uh, where my data is. So we've got list one and list two. Then it need to know um, whether what our alternative hypothesis is. So we're going to choose that not equals two. From there, we're going to get our test statistic. All right, so I throw that in my calculator. I get a t test. Uh, our t-test statistic of 3.357 and a p-value of 0 0.0038, right? Remember, that's just telling me how many standard errors I am from a difference of zero. We're up here, 3.357 standard errors. And I have a little probability of 0 0.0038. So we're trying to say that that's really far away because I have a small thing. I can do the formal check. Is the p-value less than the level of significance? So my, oh, sorry about that. That was out of control. Oh my goodness. All right, I think we're in place. So my p-value is 0 0.0038. My level of significance that they gave me way up somewhere is 0 0.01. If it helps, put those out to the same number of decimal places, and I can see that, yes, this is lower than this one. And whenever I say yes, we're going to reject H0. And that tells me that this sample, or these two samples, are so unusual that I do not think the two true means are equal. So for our conclusion, we're gonna say there is evidence to claim right? Because I'm rejecting H0, when I write my hypothesis, basically it should say this. The true mean difference in alpha waves frequency for confined and non-confined prisoners is different. So I gotta make sure I get that context of the problem into my summary. But there's some parts that stay the same, right? That mean difference, and then I have to talk about what are the things we're comparing. If I ask you to find a confidence interval, we've already decided it's a two SAMP T, so that part stays the same. Instead of the test though, we just wanna do the interval. When you go to this, you're gonna have the same inputs that you had before, list one, frequency one. The only difference is we have to tell it the confidence level of 99%. All right, so I put that in my calculator. I get 0.108. 1.491, okay. And again, this is a very small number. It's not the actual count of alpha waves. Those, these, the size of these numbers are very different than our data. 
remember that this is the mean difference is somewhere between there. So again, we have this format where we start with how confident we are. We are 99% confident. The true mean difference in frequency is between, I'm going to just round to one place now, I'm running out of space, 0.1 and 1.5 waves with non-confined inmates. having the higher frequency. This is in part why it was important to keep track who we list, list, listed first. Notice up here in the null hypothesis, I have non-confined first. So it's setting up the difference, non-confined minus confined. So if that difference is a positive number, right? This interval is all positive. That must mean the first group had the higher mean. So that's where I got this non-confining confining inmates is higher. All right, once I've made a decision um, about the test, the interval tells me the same thing. It also tells me it's different. Um, we can say, well, what kind of sampling error might have happened? Um, so what type of um, error? It all depends on whether we rejected or did not reject. So when I come up here and say we rejected H0, we know the type of error associated with that is a type 1. Anytime I reject, I'm open to a type 1, right? When they say, what's the implication of this error, all this means is that we claimed there was a difference for the two groups of inmates. But due to sampling variation, there's a small chance in this case, it's our level of significance, 0.01, small chance, we are wrong. Right? We could just be unlucky and haven't gotten one of those very few samples that is not representative, right? And there is no difference. in the frequency. All right, so basically the implications is just saying this is what we claimed, we could be wrong, and the opposite thing could be true. All right, let's go on to number two. This time again, we want to read through and underline or mark things that might help us make a decision. It says a company institutes an exercise break for its workers to see if it will improve job satisfaction as measured by a questionnaire. And it says a higher number on this questionnaire means they're more satisfied. They take scores for 10 randomly selected workers. So I know my sample size and I know they were randomly selected. And they took both a before measure and an after measure uh, when they implemented an exercise program. Okay, so when I look at this data, right, I can see that again, I have quantitative data things I could take a mean of. So this would be a mean problem. I can see two sets of data. The next thing I have to look at in my uh, decision tree is the fact, are these independent or paired data? We can see that the same person gave us two values. So this is telling me I have paired data. So in terms of the name of the test, we have a paired t-test, or we could say a t-test on paired differences. Right? 
And if I continue down, I can see what the shape of my hypothesis should look like. Because it's differences that we're going to focus on, we're going to collapse this data, right? If this is my list one and list two, I'm going to subtract these and get a new set of data. I'm going to try to decide which one I want to subtract. It seems like list for after, most of those numbers did get higher. So if it was going to improve the satisfaction, I would expect this to be a larger number. So my subtractions I'm going to decide is be after minus before. And then I'm going to say, well, that would make my average difference to be a positive number or greater than zero. My null hypothesis is, of course, that there is no difference. So my list three is going to be after minus before. I can label these two, list one and list two. I just need to make sure that in my calculator, when I do list three, I want to do the after, which if I set it up this way is list two minus list one. And all my work will be done on that list three then. Okay. So let's go ahead and put those in my calculator, list one, list two, list three. You can pause the video and do that if you want to work along. Once I get that in there, I'm going to use that to check my assumptions. First, we have already said it that random was stated. Second, we know our n is 10, so n is definitely not greater than or equal to 30. So we have to check our histogram of list three. All right, so again, you're going to do second stat plot. Choose your histogram. Make sure you've got list three with a frequency of one, and then zoom nine. And again, you're going to get a nice little histogram. You'll see no outliers and no long tails, no skew. So it looks like our conditions are met. We're ready to go ahead and implement the um, paired t-test. So to perform this test, all our data has been collapsed down to these differences in list three. So when I do this, I really only have one set of data. So even though it's called a paired t-test, we're going to use our t-test button Everything's in data. We're going to compare it to zero, our sample to zero. Our data is in list three with a frequency of one. And then I need to tell my computer that, or in my calculator, that we wanted a greater than. So these are all the inputs, right? When I say calculator steps, make sure you tell me your inputs. When I hit enter, I will get my test statistic and key value. So I found T was 3.597 uh, and P was 0 0.0029. Again, I'm going to check is my P value less than the significance level? 0 0.0029 and I'm going to compare it to 0 0.05. Again, if it helps, put these out to the same number of decimal places. It makes it easy to compare. I can see this 29 is definitely lower than 500 ten thousandths. So it's lower. So I'm going to say yes, and we're going to reject H naught. Right. So for my conclusion, we are saying that this is so far away from our um, hypothesis of zero difference. We're going to say there is evidence that there's a difference in the true mean satisfaction. I'm saying this sort of goofily. Sorry, I'm gonna start this fresh and 
Um, my cat's over here purring wildly. I'm a little distracted. Sorry about that. There is evidence to claim. There is a true mean. The true mean improvement in satisfaction is greater after starting the exercise program. Again, just important to get that context in to say, what are we talking about? What are those numbers talking about? They asked me to find a 90% confidence interval. So again, if I decided it was a paired t-test, we know this is going to be a paired t interval. But just like we use the t-test button down here, we're going to use the t-interval button. Okay, so when I go to that button, again, it's going to have that same input of list three with a frequency of one. And now I just have to put in my confidence level of 0 0.90. Four point, I'm going to just round to two places, one seven and 12.83 is my interval, right? And again, we said the difference was greater after starting it. So that means the true difference is above zero. And notice that my interval is above zero. So I know that this matches or tells me the same results as my t-test. If I want to write the interpretation, we are 90% confident. The true mean improvement in satisfaction. is between 4.17 and 12.83. With the exercise program increasing satisfaction. Okay. What type of error are we open to? Again, I look up here and said we rejected H naught. So we know it's going to be a type one error possible. All right. We claimed there was a difference in satisfaction, or we claimed there was an improvement. in satisfaction with the exercise program. But there is a small chance, right? That's our level of significance, 0 0.05. We are wrong. So we might just have been unlucky when we chose these 10 people and picked all the people who are most receptive to exercise and it showed an improvement. But it's a very small chance that we'd pick an unusual sample like that when we are just doing it randomly. So that's what we mean that there's just a small chance that we're wrong um, and that satisfaction doesn't truly increase. All right.
Number three. One month before an election, a poll of 630 select randomly selected voters, so that's a sample size, showed 340 planning to vote for candidate Smith. So that's a group of people that met some criteria. It's a subgroup of this 130. So that's my X for a number of successes. The success being that they voted for candidate Smith. And this was before an election. It says a week later, it becomes known he had an extramarital affair and a new poll. So this is the second poll. Had a success of 550 pe 15 people still planning to support him out of 1,010 in the sample. So I have two different sample sizes here. So I can tell that there's two samples, so two populations, and I have parts out of a whole. So that's a proportion problem. So a proportion with two samples. So we know we have a two prop Z test. And I can look on my tree diagram and see that my hypotheses are saying, let's look at the proportion before they found out about the affair and compare it to the proportion after. So I let before be my group one and the after be my group two. As an alternative, I know that P before and the P after will be the same, and I have to decide, do I need a less than, a greater than, or a not equals to? We're worried about whether it decreased in support. So when I look at this, if I started at the before level and I decrease to the after, this one's gonna be bigger than this one. So I need a greater than sign. A little tricky. I see that word decrease, and people are going to want a lesson sign. But we're saying that before had a higher proportion than after supporting candidate Smith. All right. Once we have these two pieces, I just need to go back to my note sheet and say, what were the assumptions for any type of proportion test? I need to check random. I need to check is the population at least n times 20. I'm going to have to do that for both. And then finally, I need to check are the number of successes greater than or equal to 10 for both? And is the number of fails greater than or equal to 10? Right. So random was stated. Stated in the first one, we're assuming that the people who did the second study followed the same protocol. The population n times 20. So for the first group, we had an n of 630. So I'm going to take 630 times 20. And I get 12,600. 12,600. If I do it for group two, I get 10, 10 times 20. So I get 20,200. And for these population, the population we're worried about are voters in this election, right? So if it's, let's just assume it's a large community, whether it's a city or a state, So more than 20,200 people are voters available to pull a sample from, okay? Che technically, we're checking both, but if there's at least 20,000, then there must be at least 12,000 when we did it before, okay? Last one, successes and failures. If I look at group one, the number of successes are the number of people who voted to support him. And that's 340, and that's greater than 10. In group two, there were 515, and that is greater than or equal to 10.
So that's good. Number of fails, we have a formula for that n times one minus p, but they didn't give it to me as a percentage. It's not a problem, right? If I know 340 voted for him, I'm gonna just take the total and say, well, minus 340, how many people did not vote for him? 290, and that's greater than 10. In the second study, I had 1,100 people total, 515 voted for him. So that leaves 495 who did not. So that's the fails. And that is greater than 10. So it looks like all our conditions are met and we can run the test. Right. So we need to inter our, uh, record our calculator steps. We know the button is two prop Z test. It's going to ask us what is the, the null hypothesis. Um, oh, sorry, I am so wrong. <laughs> um, we are, I'm out of control here. We have to put in population one, which we said was the before group. Uh, we had 340 out of an N of, 6.30, and then I have, in the second study, 5.15 for my number of successes out of 1,010, and I have to tell my calculator I want a greater than. So when I enter that, I get my z-score, 1.174, and my p-value of 0.01201. Is P less than my level of significance? It's always my question. Compare 1 to 0, 01. Is it less than 0. 0.05? And again, if it helps, write that out to the same number of decimal places. And I can see it is not less than. So we are going to not reject H naught. So in my conclusion, we're going to say there is not evidence to claim whatever the alternative hypothesis is, but I need to put it in English words. So they said to claim that the true proportion before is there's no evidence to say it's greater than the proportion afterwards. The true proportion Supporting Smith before is greater than after the news came out. So we're just saying there's no evidence of this. We're going to keep this and say it's not that. All right. So if there's no difference, when I find the confidence interval, I'm expecting to have zero in that interval because we're saying the difference is zero. There's no difference between the two. So let's find our confidence interval and see if that's true. We already decided it was a two prop Z. So now instead of test, we want to just grab the interval tool. I'm going to have that same entries as above. In fact, your calculator will remember it. All I got to do is tell them that I want a 0 0.90 confidence interval in addition. For the proportion, I have to remember that these are proportions that I get out of my calculator. And you'll see that one of them is negative and one of its point is positive. So on the number line, we can see that zero is in the interval. 
That's why we're saying that there's no difference. The difference is close to zero. There's no significant difference, All right? So this supports what we claimed above. If I wrote it into a nice template for our um, uh, interpretation, we would say we are 90% confident. The true difference in voter support is between negative 0.012. And if I did that as a percent, it'd be negative 1.2% and 0.071 or a positive 7.1%, right? And because I have this negative and positive, I'm not gonna say one's greater than the other because we're claiming there is no difference. Because we did not reject H naught, our type of error is a type two, right? We found no evidence of a decrease in support, but there is a small chance that we are wrong. Right? If we just happen to be unlucky in our sampling and get an unrepresentative sample that's far away from the true result. Right. All right, let's hop on to number four. The National Perinatal Statistics Unit of Sydney's Children's Hospital reported the mean birth weight for all babies born in birth centers in Australia and 2002 was 786 pounds, right? When I look at this, careful reading, we're talking about all babies born. This is a population parameter, right? Not a sample. We're not saying we have a second sample in here. This is just the number that we are comparing a sample to. Right, it says a Maryland hospital reports the average weight of 112 babies born in 2002 was 7.68 pounds with a standard deviation of 1.31 pounds. If we believe the Maryland babies fairly represent US newborns, is there evidence that unit S babies and Australian babies do not weigh the same amount at birth? Right, so when I look at here, I can see the word average, I could see the word mean, right? That's telling me it's gonna be some kind of t-test. Anytime it's averages or means, and we only have one sample with a mean. So if I follow my tree um, decision tree, I'm gonna see that leads me to my t-test, right? And then I've got a template for my hypothesis. Either the mean is going to equal that number we're comparing to in Australia, 7.89, or sorry, 86 pounds, or I have to decide what the alternative is. Were the researchers hypothesizing that it was less than in the US, greater than in the US, or different from? So they just said any evidence that they do not weigh the same they're not conjecturing that our US babies are heavier or lighter, just we're asking, are they different? So I'm gonna use a not equal sign. So I'm gonna to go to my t-test. I have to tell them what my number comparing to is, 7.86. It's gonna ask me for my sample mean, which was 7.68. My sample standard deviation, 1.31, my sample size of 112. And then I have to say, what was my alternative hypothesis? It was that it was not equal to. 
So once I enter all that, I'm going to find my test statistic is negative 1.454, and my p-value is 0 0.1487. Again, I can see that t is a negative. Notice that my sample value was below the number I was comparing to. So I'm saying I'm 1.45. 454 stand, standard errors below that um, uh, value in our null hypothesis, right? And that gives me a probability of getting that, a sample that far from the mean or more extreme to be 0.1487. So is our p-value less than our level of significance? 0.1487 is not less than a 0.05. So we are going to, again, fail our do not reject H0. Hmm. You know what? I put all this stuff under check the assumptions. I'm out of control, right? So all this stuff belongs down here. I was just writing away happily. We didn't check our assumptions. We have, was it random? It is not stated, right? So we're going to have to assume this, right? So it's important to know when we're just assuming something in real life, we could dig deeper into the study and see if they did take a representative random sample. Okay. Our N was 112, and that is greater than 30. So that condition is met. All right. So with that assumption, we're saying we can use this t-test, and I've got my test statistic and p-value. We decided do not reject H0. So now we need to make our conclusion. There is not evidence. Or there is no evidence to claim the true mean birth weight for U.S. babies is different from Australian babies. And again, there's lots of right ways to say that. Again, we're focusing on whether there's evidence or not, and that, that we're talking about a true uh, mean or a parameter for these populations. Um, and what is that actual uh, parameter measuring? And it was weight of babies. All right, so again, we decided this was a t-test. So the interval that goes with it is a t-interval. And you're gonna enter the same Um, measures. The only difference is that you're going to have to put in your confidence level of 0 0.05. And again, we were comparing this 7.8 six pounds. And so you can see that 7.86 is somewhere inside of that interval, right? So we're saying the true mean is somewhere in there and 7.86 is in there. So they're close together. There's no significant difference between the U.S. baby's weights and this number we're comparing it to, right? So we are 95% confident. The true mean weight of U.S. babies is between 7.435 pounds and 7.925 pounds. We did not reject H0, so we know we're open to a type two error, right? We claim they're different or they're not different.
but there's a small chance. We are wrong. It's not wrong because we did the statistics wrong. It's just that there's a small chance that when I grab a, sa a sample that I'm very unlucky and I just pick this very unusual random sample that ends up in the far uh, tails of our sampling distribution. All right, one to go. A study of the effects of the acid rain on trees in the Hopkins forest showed that 12 of 50 trees sampled exhibited some kind of damage from acid rain. This rate seemed to be higher than the 15% quoted in a recent article. Notice that this 15%, they don't tell us anything about that study. It's just a number we are comparing our sample to. So I have one sample up here where 12 were damaged out of 50 trees. So that 50 is my N and the 12 is my number of successes, All right? And that's what's telling me it's a proportion. And again, the proportion's not in here, but I see that percentage that helps clue me in that it's a prop test, a one proportion Z test. And then when I look at my tree decision tree, I can see that the sample or the hypothesis should have a P for proportion. And we're comparing the proportion to 0.15, that 15%. My alternative hypothesis, I need to decide if there's a less than, greater than, or not equals to. We're talking about it being more susceptible. If trees are more susceptible to damage, that means there'd be a higher percent of damaged trees. So I'm saying, is my proportion in Hopkins forest greater than that 15% we're comparing it to? Because it's a proportion, I need to check the proportion conditions. Was this a random sample? Hmm, not stated. So we would have to check farther or we're just gonna have to assume that because we can't really check. Next, I have to say is the population at least 20 times N. So 200, or sorry, 20 times 50 trees, not 200 trees. I get 1,000 trees. We are talking about a forest here, so it seems reasonable to assume there are at least 1,000 trees in the forest from which we could have pulled a sample. Finally, we need to check is our number of successes or our N times P greater than or equal to 10. And then I also have to check my number of fails, N times one minus P greater than or equal to 10. Because we have a sample or a, sorry, a population proportion that we're comparing it to, we're going to actually use that 0.15 for our P. So we have 50 trees times 0.15. And I get 7.5 trees. And that is not greater than 10, right? So our conditions are not met. Remember, this condition is supposed to measure, do we have a large enough sample? So this is telling us we do not have a large enough sample. So when we look at the sampling distribution, it will not necessarily form a normal curve. And this test is all based on having a normal sampling distribution. So if I can't ensure that I can use a normal curve, I am done, I can't do this test. We'd have to go back and say, we need more data or a larger sample. So 
So we're just going to end it right there. So like I said, this does a nice pull together of everything we've got in chapters 8 through 11. Chapter 12, those are categorical variables with many categories. So it's going to be a very different type of test. We won't be using the normal curves at all. Um, but these five, if you can do these five problems top to bottom and decide easily what type of tests they are in, you should be in good shape. Happy studying. Let me know if you have questions.